Good morning, Chicago. It is my pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Jackie Robinson Ivy, and I serve as one of the Board of Governors for the City Club of Chicago. On behalf of Dr. Ed Mazur, our chair, and the other members of the board, I welcome you. Today, we are here to have a conversation with the City Treasurer of Chicago, Melissa Conyers Irvin. I'm going to read her bio shortly, um, but before then, I want to take care of a couple of things. Um, I would like to uh, let everyone know that while we are not in our wonderful Maggiano's, I hope everyone is having something wonderful for lunch. It may not be the uh, Maggiano's masticcioli or lasagna and cannolis, but hope you're, hopefully you're having something. Um, our sponsors for today are BMO Harris, Chicago Federation of Labor, ComEd, Deloitte & Touche, Metropolitan Peer and Exposition Authority, Northern Trust, People's Gas, and Roosevelt University. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a member of the City Club, please go to our webpage, and uh, we certainly would uh, uh, admonish and admire anyone who might be becoming new members or those of you who might, would like to re-up your membership. If you have any questions about what's on our webpage, of course, you can call the office. Um, we are broadcasting live from the City Club offices. Um, Let's see, I want to go straight into your bio treasurer because we want to use as much time as we can to hear what you have to say today. Melissa Conyers Irvin is the current city treasurer of the city of Chicago and a former state rep for the 10th district. She believes in the promise of opportunity and the strength of families to effortly address the needs of our communities. As a product of a single parent household, Melissa has seen firsthand the value of education and faith from her mother. Through hard work and determination, Melissa became the first in her family to graduate from college and earn an MBA from the Roosevelt University. She has more than 15 years of experience in the insurance industry as an executive for Allstate and CS Insurance Strategies. Melissa is well qualified and, and, and intimately aware of the challenges in this diverse and vibrant city of Chicago. As city treasurer, Melissa plans to focus her private sector and financial training on ways to increase economic development in Chicago's neighborhoods. She believes that Chicago's $9.5 billion portfolio should be leveraged to help Chicago communities grow at the same economic rate, regardless of their zip code. In addition to her extensive civic and financial backgrounds, Melissa is passionate about giving back to the community, very passionate. She has served as a mentor for high school girls and co-chair of several events for the community, including the popular Back to School Festival that provides school supplies for over 1,000 children. Melissa is married and has a daughter and is a proud member of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. Melissa and her husband live in Garfield Park and their young daughter, we affectionately call her Miss Geneva. Also, um, she serves as the youth director, I'm sorry, she serves as youth superintendent at Mount Vernon Church and participates in a youth mentoring program for teenage girls. Melissa also founded a book, women's book club that draws members from Roscoe Village to Lawndale. Melissa is prepared to meet the challenges of the office. She is committed to protecting and growing the city's $9.5 billion portfolio while serving as the only citywide elected official to sit on four pension boards. Melissa considers it an honor to serve the city of Chicago as its treasurer. She cares deeply about the community and will work diligently to restore the integrity, honesty, and dedication that the entire city of Chicago deserves. And now I present to you the treasurer of the city of Chicago, Melissa Conyers Irvin. Good morning, treasurer. Good morning, Jackie. Good morning. And thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, I want to just take a moment and let you know that I am certainly praying for you and your family in your recent loss of your mother. It's actually amazing that you are back at it so soon. And also I wanna say hi to everyone that is joining us virtually on today. I am honored to be here with you all. Although I must admit that I wish that we could be together in the same room having this discussion. Hopefully next year brings better things and we can experience the wonderful City Club tradition of in-person again. I also want to give a special thanks to the board for having me on today, but I have to tell the board that I feel a little kind of slighted that we are not eating the famous Maggiano's chicken <laughs> this morning during this speech. But this really just tells you the kind of year that 2020 has been. This year has been challenging for so many people. 
I've been in the treasurer's role for nearly a year and a half now. It's like, wow, time flies. And it has been a journey of unexpected challenges. In February, we were conducting a series of the first ever city treasurer town halls all across the city discussing our 2019 performance. Little did we know what was just around the corner. I would never have imagined within my first year as city treasurer that we will be managing the taxpayer's portfolio through a pandemic. So needless to say, I am so extremely proud of the work that my team has done and how we've managed the city's investment portfolio. And I look forward to the initiatives we have coming, which I'll get to a little more, um, a little bit later. When I meet people, of course, they assume that the role of the city treasurer means money, but I'm not certain that they truly know what this word, this role entails. As city treasurer, I am first and foremost a fiduciary of taxpayer dollars. In my role, I have three mandates. First, to ensure the safety of principal and not lose money. I'd like to underline not lose money. And I certainly don't need to mention how important this first point is, especially during a time such as this. Second, manage the liquidity needs of the city by making, making certain that we can pay our bills. Third, obtain the highest risk adjusted return using allowable investments, making sure taxpayers' money is working for them. Now, really that's a mouthful, but to achieve these multiple mandates, we manage the city's portfolio as a passive manager, or one may refer to it as buy and hold investor guided by a conservative investment policy that was put in ordinance by the city council. Now, as opposed to my work with the four city pension funds, which we would classify as more active strategies, in the treasurer's office, we look to create a well-diversified, high-quality, liquid fixed income security portfolio that can withstand a wide range of economic cycles and market volatility which has truly been put to the test this year. Now I am often asked, how have you changed your investment policy in the wake of this pandemic? And the answer is, we haven't. Now you may wonder why. Well, it's, it's because we had a sound investment policy already and the portfolio we've constructed can withstand an economic downturn. But I would like to clarify passive because it doesn't mean that we're just sitting on our hands. While we haven't changed policy, we have changed our strategy. You can't close the nation's economy and not expect that there will be a negative impact on local finances. As the pandemic hit, we needed to pivot to focus solely on liquidity and the preservation of capital. Now we're all aware of the unprecedented response by the Federal Reserve, Congress, and the Treasury Department. The corresponding recovery in asset prices has been nothing short of breathtaking. And while we cannot rule out a second wave of volatility, we think that our portfolio is very well positioned for the possible outcomes. So what was our strategy? Well, the first thing we looked to do was to build our cash position to what we think is a prudent level. The second was to shift all of our maturities to a short-term liquidity strategy. We basically built a 90-day maturity ladder to have a significant amount of cash that is due every week. This allows us to grow our liquidity position as significantly should the need arise during this pandemic. Now that balance is important because we want to make certain that we are holding the right amount of cash. We also wanted to get a good handle on our cash flows. So we ran scenario analysis that simulated significant drags on our projected revenue and expenses. 
I would say that even during some very drastic scenarios, we are on target to meet the liquidity needs of the city. So even while guiding the city's finances through a global pandemic, my team has managed to prudently manage taxpayer dollars. In fact, even during this pandemic, when others are barely breaking even, we expect to make money for taxpayers this year. Now, while the result may not be as great as $224 million that we earned in 2019, which I might add was during my first year in office, I am proud of my team and I that we will be in line with the $157 million of 2018 and ahead of the $118 million earned in 2017. So the city's finances and investments are doing well despite the challenges my office has faced. So yes, you can breathe now. <laughs> I really wanted to spend some time this morning going through our portfolio with you because these are certainly unprecedented times. And as taxpayers, I believe that you deserve to know. And by the way, you are the first to hear this news this morning, the first, that we did not lose money during this pandemic. We actually made money. Now, some may wonder, how did you all weather this storm in the city treasurer's office? How did you do this? Well, as a native Chicagoan raised by a single mother, I'm used to dealing with challenges and finding ways to do more with less. Rolling up my sleeves and getting in the trenches to make things happen really is second nature to me. But I'm dedicated to providing resources to those in underserved communities who are disproportionately impacted at a time such as this. In 2020, we have seen so many families who have been disproportionately impacted. I think the best way to describe this past year is a tale of two cities. Some of you may know the 1859 novel by Charles Dickens that follows the intertwined lives of people living in London and Paris during the French Revolution. The title of this novel also applies to the country and especially to our beloved city. As much as we long to be one unified city, we are a city divided by economic privilege with one group struggling to keep food on the table before and during a pandemic and another group that has the necessary resources to stay afloat in times of difficulty. We even see this split in health disparities. And even before COVID-19 took a disproportionate number of black and brown lives, Chicago had a life expectancy gap of 30 years, depending on whether you lived in Streeterville or Inglewood. While my office is tasked with fulfilling our fiduciary duty to taxpayers and developing investment policies that strive to maximize risk adjusted return, we also look beyond that duty to build a body of work that promotes equity in the city as a means of uniting us all. Many of you may or may not know that I am the only elected official who serves as a trustee on all four of the city's pension funds. And I'll tell you, my staff and I spend an extraordinary amount of time preparing for each pension fund meeting to make certain that we are abreast by how the fund is performing and able to make vital decisions on behalf of the annuitants and beneficiaries. Now, I did not know before taking office how vital of a role I would play in these pension funds. And believe me, I am not just showing up for meetings. I'm questioning, I'm probing, I'm having sometimes uncomfortable conversations because the taxpayers, annuitants, and beneficiaries deserve better. I'm asking questions that no one wants to ask. Why? 
because I see my role as more than getting the greatest dollar return. I always look at the impact on lives behind the numbers. The treasurer's office has made financial empowerment a core pillar of our work. And my staff has heard me say it hundreds of times. Matter of fact, I think they can recite it for me, but I feel the need to recite it again. Shame on us if all we do is manage the city's investment portfolio. We must change lives. That has been my guiding principle from day one. And we have the platform to do more for the residents of this city. Chicago is the third largest city in the country with a $690 billion GDP. And we have approximately $9 billion in assets under management that my office manages daily. That is our platform to make change. Money equals power. But what seems like the biggest part of our role, getting a return on taxpayer dollars, is actually a smaller part of our role. As I mentioned to you a few moments ago, my team and I, we certainly know how to make money. <laughs> Matter of fact, I made certain to get the best of the best by acquiring a chief investment officer that spent three decades on Wall Street. But the real task is making a measurable impact in ways that get to the root of economics and eradicate the barriers that hold people back from economic justice. That's why my focus has been so heavily on financial empowerment and issues of economic justice. I have to tell you that sometimes when I hear myself say that, it still surprises me. A city treasurer talking about financial empowerment and economic justice. It can be done. We've partnered with the state treasurer's office to address ethnic and gender board diversity through the Midwest Investment Diversity Initiative, which is a 13 member coalition representing more than $870 billion in assets, billions. Remember I said money is power. Since 2016, the coalition has engaged 52 companies that were lagging in director diversity. And 37 of those companies have committed to making change. Now I want to stick a pin right there because I think that it's important that I talk to you about what the city treasurer's office is doing. As I was always taught as a little girl to practice what I preach. 62% of our staff in the city treasurer's office are racial minorities and 54% are female. I must include this point and I'll speak more to this a little bit later. Our senior leadership is 71% minorities and 71% female. So when I urge other organizations to improve their metrics, I'm speaking from experience. After we made sure our own house was in order, we took a hard look at how we evaluate the companies we do business with. And one of our biggest achievements over the last year has been to create a new first ever broker dealer scorecard to change the way we evaluate those companies. The scorecard is a little like what you see in baseball, but instead of calculating batting averages, we calculate how diverse a firm is and how much it gives back to the community. Minority ownership is only a part of it. In fact, we no longer work with several minority owned businesses because they had very little diversity aside from their ownership. We examine people in leadership and whether there's a path to growth for people of color. Today, almost 56% of our trading volume in the city <clears throat> treasurer's office is with MBE, WBE, and veteran-owned companies, up from 45% when I took office. 
We've gotten calls from other municipalities all over the country that want to model their process after ours. So of course, we could not be more proud. Actually, we haven't even heard of any other municipalities with this level of commitment. Now, in addition to managing taxpayer dollars, being a trustee of all four of the city's pension funds, as city treasurer, I'm also the chairman of the Chicago Catalyst Fund. When the pandemic hit, we knew that we had to react quickly. We partnered with the mayor's office and committed to contributing up to $50 million of the Catalyst Fund, which is our social impact fund, towards the Chicago Small Business Resiliency Fund, which was truly a lifeline for many of Chicago's small businesses this spring and summer, particularly in underserved communities as they tried to cope with the fallout of COVID-19 and the economic disaster that came with it. We were able to make investments in companies like Nicole Jordan Catering, a company that had been growing 49% every year since 2016. But when the pandemic hit, everything stopped. And Nicole Jordan, the owner, found herself in a dire situation. Nicole applied to the Small Business Resiliency Loan Fund and received $30,000 to help pay rent, insurance, a new website, and gave Nicole and her team the space to pivot her business model towards prepared meal delivery. Nicole said the loan was a godsend but you have to understand that businesses like Nicole's are a godsend to the communities where they operate and employ people. They work hard to get to where they are. And I feel a responsibility to our communities to help ensure that they can weather the storm. Now, we all know that COVID-19 wasn't the only crisis to overwhelm our city and country this year. We have experienced a reckoning with America's legacy of racism and the day-to-day -day realities of what racial injustice has done to black and brown Americans for generations and still does today. That's why I made a commitment to doing even more to address the systemic racism that permeates our systems. In Chicago, a report this summer found that mortgage lenders have invested more in a single white neighborhood than in all black neighborhoods combined. That's astonishing. One single white neighborhood than in all black neighborhoods combined. Now, some might think, well, Fewer people want to buy in those neighborhoods and the properties may be worth less. But let me tell you, I purchased my first home on the west side of Chicago in North Lundale through a program called New Homes for Chicago way before I took office. Without that program, I don't know if I would have been able to afford the steep down payment, even though at the time, I was an executive at Allstate with a degree in finance, simply because it was in the North Lundale area and banks are reluctant to lend there, not even to someone who was able to pay it back. So tell me, when black and brown people have to leave their communities to get a mortgage, what happens to the communities that they leave behind? And if they choose not to leave, how are they supposed to create the kind of generational wealth that uplifts families and entire communities? Even the practice of lending based on credit scores perpetuates discrimination. I've known plenty of people 
who hand over $1,500 for rent every month, but can never get approved for a mortgage because they did not have qualifying credit scores. Another problem is that banks have simply been exiting black neighborhoods. Since 2010, the branch footprint in majority black areas has shrunk nearly 15% compared to under 10% in non-majority black areas. Why is that? Even income doesn't explain it. Even the wealthy black neighborhoods have lost more branches. So the result is that the vacuum is filled with predatory lenders like payday loan centers and check cashers, which trap people in a cycle of debt that they can never escape. And some of these problems are not created intentionally. I will acknowledge that. But the problem is that they're not intentionally avoided either. We need thoughtful, conscientious consideration of how traditional banking practices and policies affect Black Americans. And that's why my office is working with State Treasurer Michael Ferrix to form the Advancing Equity and Banking Commission. Through that commission, we've brought together CEOs from financial institutions across the state to discuss solutions to address structural and systemic racism in the banking industry. They're examining everything from lending practices to their own hiring and career development practices. And when they're done next year, I look forward to coming back to share the findings with you, along with specific commitments from our CEOs. That is what this, that's what this is all about. We have to stop talking about what we aim to do and start talking about what we are doing. I have a young daughter and Jackie mentioned her in the introduction and she's something else by the way, <laughs> but I have a young daughter and our city is full of young people who deserve better. And if they are still fighting these battles in 20 years, it will mean that we have failed. Which leads me to the calls to action that I leave with you today. First, it is long past time that we increase lending in Black communities. I shared my story of being unable to get a loan for a home in the North Londale area, despite being eligible. How many other people have this happened to? And how many people have been chased away from their communities because of it? I grew up in an underserved community, but I now live in one by choice. But how many people are not given that choice because banks are hesitant to lend there? And the biggest question of all, what would those communities be like if those people deny mortgages over the last 30 years had been approved to own homes in the communities that they loved? But I'm not just talking about mortgages. I want to see more small business loans funding the brilliant ideas of black and brown entrepreneurs and helping them expand their companies. I want to see home equity lines of credit so people can take on those home improvement projects they've been dreaming of. I want to see auto loans so the job market opens up for people beyond what they can reach via public transportation. I have no doubt that the Advancing Equity and Banking Commission is looking at these issues. And I look forward to seeing meaningful recommendations and commitments to change come from it. My second call to action, we need more diversity 
in the financial services industry. Now, I mentioned earlier that I believe in practicing what I preach. My first deputy and chief of staff is a black woman lawyer with an Ivy League degree and deep finance and banking background. My chief impact officer is a black woman banker with an MBA from Booth and industry experience. Now there is so much more talent out there. And I have to believe that the companies indicating that they can't find it aren't really trying that hard. One of the ways I want to see this effort manifest is increasing the diversity in pension fund management. As I mentioned to you, I am the only elected official that serves on all four of the city's employee pension funds. And I'm the treasurer of Chicago Teachers Pension Fund. We're talking about approximately $8 billion in assets under management. And I am shocked, I mean shocked, by the lack of diversity in the management of those funds. Just look at the diversity of taxpayers contributing to those funds. About 30% of our city is Black, 30% Latino. But you never know it by looking at those who manage our taxpayers' money through pension funds. And to me, that just doesn't add up. We need to be intentional about making sure our dollars are invested in a way that not only benefits all of taxpayers, but also in a way that upholds the values of all of our communities. Representation matters, and it especially matters to the bottom line. A 2017 international report by McKinsey showed that companies with a high level of worker diversity were 33% more likely to exceed the median profits of their peers. What does that mean? Companies with a more diverse workforce generally make more money. My third and final call to action is that we need our young people to see the world of finance as an option for them. I can't tell you how many young people I've met on the south and west sides of Chicago who have never even heard of the financial services industry, let alone even think that finance is an option that they can achieve. We have to increase awareness and exposure and provide opportunities to young people who may want to pursue careers in the financial services industry because we need them and their perspectives in those companies. My office has been working with broker dealers to provide internships and job shadowing opportunities, but we need other companies in Chicago to step up and do the same. And even if young people don't necessarily pursue the career in financial services, we should provide financial education to young people so that they will know how to think about money and how to envision a future built on financial independence. All of these things are key to wealth creation. So I say all of that to say that we have a lot of work to do. Not just the city treasurer's office, but everyone that is watching and every financial service company in the industry. Despite all of the hard work ahead of us, I am optimistic. Matter of fact, people always ask me, how are you positive all the time with everything that is going on? a pandemic that is disproportionately hitting black and brown communities, racial injustice that is taking black lives and black brilliance from this world, a country that is very much at a crossroads. And the answer is, 
that every morning when I wake up, I know that I have a mission. I know that the people of Chicago have entrusted me with that mission and that I cannot let them down. They give me purpose. They believe it's possible to create a better future together. And so do I. And that mutual belief and hope, along with hard work, are enough to get us through anything. Thank you. Thank you, Treasurer. Everyone ought to be not only informed, but inspired following those comments. I'm going to give you a second to sip your tea or whatever that is, and um, we're going to prepare your water. Um, to prepare for questions. Um, TW is going to kind of help me maneuver here because we're um, we're working off of two screens here. Um, for those of you who are watching, the treasurer is in City Hall at her office. And again, we are broadcasting from the City Club offices um, over on Hubbard Street. So um, I think we'll just start with, first we have an acknowledgement. Can you hear me, treasurer? I hear you great. Oh, okay. So first we have an acknowledgement from one of, I think um, I'm biased, but one of the people that I think is a Chicago institution, and that is none other than the Mr. Lester McKeever. He says, excellent presentation, Treasurer Conyers Irvin, keep up the outstanding work. Thank so you. So not so much a question, but a comment. Thank you. And we, we all love uh, Mr. McKeever. So let's get straight into some of these questions. We have a question from Dinkar Karyamuri, and I don't know if he's a member or not. Um, normally you all know that when we're in the room, I don't ask your question if I don't know if you're a member or if I don't have your name, but you get a pass today because we are working uh, remotely. This question says, how is the city modernizing the business to make it contactless for citizens? And I think he means from your office perspective. Okay, I'm glad he means from my office because I can certainly answer that. <laughs> um, and so we, in our office, we have really focused a lot on communications, truly, especially during this pandemic. Um, it, it kind of like went and um, I would say just fast forward drive. And what we have been doing is that we increased our um, capacity on social media. We are on all three social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. But also, we send out weekly newsletters and I'm actually glad that question was asked because I did not include it in my comments this morning. We send out a newsletter and the way that you can sign up if you do not receive our newsletters is if you go to our website, chicagocitytreasurer.com, you can sign up to receive our newsletters and it has so much information. Let me tell you this, not just about the city treasurer's office, but about resources throughout the city of Chicago, about resources through the county, the federal government. One of the reasons that we did this, and by the way, we updated our website. We did that because during the pandemic, we found that in the beginning, it was so much information coming to taxpayers that it was coming from all over the place and they truly could not keep up. And so I thought about that and I said, how about we make our website, the city treasurer's office, our website a one-stop shop so that people can come to our website and find out information not only about what the city is doing, but also what the county federal governments are doing and again, sign up for our weekly newsletters. We've been talking about all kinds of things in our newsletter. But besides, I, I mentioned the treasurer's office and all of the levels of government. We've been talking about the census. Make certain you get counted. For anyone that is listening, make certain you get counted. Also, this is October. I'm going to make this fit, Jackie, <laughs> in this answer. But um, we are in the month of October. I wore pink today. Jackie has pink nails, Miss Jackie. And <laughs> we are doing this because we wanted to make certain that we are promoting awareness of breast cancer awareness. Those are examples of what is going on on our website as well as through our newsletters. I'll also mention um, before we go on to the next question, we have pivoted to virtual, just like today, we are doing the virtual city club. The treasurer's office has pivoted 
to providing resources to residents virtually. And that's why it's important for you to follow us on social media and through our website, because we are providing, hopefully everyone has heard of Money Mondays with Melissa. That is something that was developed during this pandemic. Money Mondays with Melissa, and we have had guests, um, you name it, from all levels of government, all types of business sectors, because we wanted to make certain that we were providing resources to residents and small business owners. So thank you for that question. Thank you, Treasurer. Um, Jane Can Canepa has just asked, what's the best way to contact the treasurer's office? But you've provided your information and the web page. Um, I, I certainly am familiar with your uh, Money Mondays with Melissa. Um, they've been quite informative and um, you're having quite a few, very a, a good variation of guests. So I think that's important. So Jane, I think we've answered your question. Um, John Mick says, what is one thing that each city department can do for 2021 that's a new strategy to reduce expenditures? That's a good question. That is a good question. But let me say this. The departments don't have to think about what they're going to do. They are going to decrease expenditures. That is something that I believe is public knowledge. Um, the mayor has indicated on a number of occasions that all items are on the table. That means that there are going to be some changes in 2020, um, whether departments like it or not, there will be a decrease in expenditures. I'm pretty confident of that, to be honest with you. Now, I don't know if that answers the question, but. <laughs> <laughs> I think that Mr. Mick, I think you just got your answer, your question answered. Um, let's talk a little bit about the pension funds. Um, I know that you sit on fire police laborers and teachers and, uh, that covers pretty much every public employee for the city of Chicago. It's and a huge responsibility and municipal. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, we know that that um, covers pretty much every um, public laborer, if you will, and a huge responsibility. Um, you mentioned that your team, which I, I'm a little biased. I think you have a great team um, for a couple too. of reasons. <laughs> Um, I give a, a shameless plug to um, Ashley and, and to Craig and to everyone else in your office as well, um, but I'm a little biased. Um, how much time do you all spend preparing um, for the meetings? Um, I know that you, and because you and I have had conversations regarding uh, just some of the things that you talk about in the pension fund um, meetings, particularly circulating, circulating around um, diversity of asset managers, et cetera. Um, how much time do you all plan as a team uh, to spend just on your monthly preparation for your meetings? So because I do sit on four of the pension funds, which is municipal labor, um, fire and police, as you mentioned, and I'm the treasurer of the Chicago Teachers Pension Fund, uh, my team and I, we were ask, actually just talking about this the other day. And the reason we were talking about this is because, to be honest with you, I don't think enough attention is truly being um, made aware for the pension funds and the vital role that is played as the city treasurer. When I was running for this role, and this is the truth, I heard like we, we spoke about it as candidates, but I had no idea that the pension funds would take up such a large portion of my time. So we spend probably about 40 hours a month just preparing for the meetings and in total, about 75 or so hours a month in total with the meetings, I'll tell you. Um, and I started to put this on social media because I'm like, people don't really know what's going on here. I can sit in a meeting one day, one pension fund meeting from 9 a.m. until like 3 p.m. all day in one meeting. And I'll make this plug because I do. I think I have a fantastic staff and I'm very grateful for that. It's a team approach. I always tell people, I believe in a team and the right people in the room to make things happen. But I wanna give credit to my fellow trustees on the pension funds. Now I mentioned that I am the only elected official. There are um, some appointed city officials that sit on the board and there are elected representatives of the members of that pension fund they put in a great amount of time 
into these pension fund meetings. So I truly, truly that I appreciate that they haven't missed a beat. And I'll tell you, Jackie, I make it my business to attend these meetings. I make it my business. I don't want to miss a minute of the meetings because I want to make certain that when decisions are being made, because these are vital decisions, I want to make certain that I'm in the room. Excellent response, Treasurer. Um, that's a huge part of your role. And the city obviously is expecting lots of things from you. And um, just from my, my professional job, um, I know the toll that it takes. And I know that the other trustees have to put in a lot of work. And many of them are not financial um, professionals. They are professionals from their business sector. Right. So it's important that they also get their um, sea legs and, and, and understand what they're doing. So thank you for that. Um, so here's another question. We don't have the name of the person. To what extent has the city relied on interfund borrowing for cash flow compared to previous years, especially the period spanning the national credit crisis from 2008? What are the funds, what, from what funds are most significant sources of monies? Well, I'll tell you this. So now we're getting into the, the role of the administration with borrowing money and pre-funding. And so my role, and, and I am distinct in this because that's a good question, but I don't want to speak for the administration in answering that question because my role as the treasurer, and I, and I get those questions all the time, my role as the treasurer is to be certain that we have the money available, liquid, to be able to pay our bills. So in regards to liquidity, I can answer those questions. In regards to pre-funding, borrowing, those are questions that actually are not originated from my office. Thank you for that response. I don't know if we are, um, if your speech was so fabulous that people are just amazed or we, uh, we have a couple more questions. I, I thought we'd have um, several, but I think what I'm guessing is that several people will be calling your office to ask you questions directly, which is fine with us. So this next question comes from Valerie King uh, at Ariel Capital Management. Uh, and they are members. Hi, Valerie. The, Hi, <laughs> the local Chicago investment management firms are so grateful for your advocacy to increase diversity in pension fund management. Um, and, and Valerie and I have talked about this as well. And um, for those of us who know Valerie's um, two bosses, uh, that would be John Rogers and uh, Melody um, Hobson, we know their commitment to um, diversity and management. And um, just from some of the other organizations that we happen to belong to from our professional seats, um, for example, the National Association of Securities Professionals, uh, we know that there is a huge push to make sure that we've got diversity in asset management and not just in um, asset management, but all of the hooks that go into it. For example, TW is sitting next to me and TW is a minority business owner. Um, we try to make sure that we pull all of that together. I know that that's hugely important to you. Um, can you talk a little bit, again, we've, you, we've talked about your team and the diversity that you bring to your team. Um, the, I'm sorry, the diversity that your team brings. But as far as asset management is concerned, um, we have a saying that there's always room for improvement. We know, and I've heard you say that um, from a Mike um, speaking in many different places. Um, we know that Ariel is one company that certainly believes in it, but can you talk a little bit about some of your conversations with other organizations, yes. certainly the financial institutions, we believe in it, as you know, we're working on some things very closely together. Um, just talk a little bit about why the importance of diversity in asset management and all the other hooks that go along with it is important for business for the city of Chicago. I really thank you for that because although I said it in my speech, I have to tell you, Jackie, this is worth reiterating, reciting. This is something that drives me. I tell you, um, I, I really, you know, if there's one thing that keeps me up at night, really two things. One is the funding of our pension funds, but second, is the diversity in the financial services industry. And so I think about our pension funds all the time. And I'll tell you, um, I was shocked when I went into the first meeting of all of the pension funds when I took office. And I was shocked at the lack of diversity in the management of these assets. Now, what I think is impo important are two words, deliberation and being intentional. And 
The reason that I think it's important to be deliberate and intentional, because I've learned that with diversity, if we're not, we will miss the boat. Now, I spoke about a 2017 McKinsey report that shows that diversity pays off, that companies that were more diverse were performed approximately 33% better than their peers. And really it's, it's a business decision and it starts from the top. So I spoke about advancing um, equity and banking commission, the commission that we have, I'm partnering with state treasurer Ferrix on. We're doing that because we're starting at the top. If we have commitment from the CEOs, I believe that that vision will dwindle all the way down to all employees. And that commitment is important. Now, let me say this. When I speak about you know, being made aware as a young person to the financial services industry, that's going to be important because how are we going to be able to build on diversity without making more young people aware of the financial services industry? And that's why I speak so much to internships, job shadowing. Those opportunities are important if we want to truly change the dynamic. And so for all those that are listening, hopefully you have internships, job shadowing in your organizations. If you want some help and support in that, please reach out to our office. Our chief investment officer and his investment team, they are working on this all the time, trying to bring more internships. I have them in my office. I can't tell you how many young people come into our office and say, I didn't even know that, there were, that the treasurer's office did all this. Sometimes I say, I didn't know either, <laughs> but nevertheless, it's, it's so much out there that our young people can be exposed to. And so I appreciate that statement. And I'll tell you, Jackie, I am a native Chicagoan and I am not afraid to have tough conversations because I bet I'd rather we have them now than I mentioned my daughter having those conversations in 20 years. That is so, so profound. Um, we do have to get this ship righted now. And, and I do know that many of the folks in your office are working on that. So thank you, Valerie, for asking that question. Um, there's another question from Kyle Sneed. Will the results of the recent city budget survey impact any priorities in your office? Well, that's very important. So first of all, um, let me start at the foundation. My office is a part of the city's budget. Um, certainly my office, I, I like to say, is the only office that pays for itself. Um, our, our office budget is probably less than half a percent of the city's overall budget, less than half a percent. And we are the only office that makes money, I would say, that we, we make uh, real money for taxpayers. And so it certainly pays for itself. I'm, I'm glad that the treasurer's office even exists. And until I truly got in this role to really appreciate that, that this office pays for itself. But also um, the city's budget is going to determine revenues. We need to know the projected revenues and expenses in order for us to properly um, run scenarios and analysis of our cash flow. Because as you know, Jackie, cash is expensive. And so we want to make certain that we are holding the right amount of cash and we certainly want to be able to invest. And so that's a balance. And um, I don't know if people truly can appreciate that analysis that is being done from my office because we have to make certain that we, we perform our cash flow analysis and we have the right scenario to hold the right amount of cash because we do not want to cost the taxpayers money and holding too much cash. So I, I think that this afternoon has been hugely informative. And to um, James and Tiffany and Monique and Royce, and I don't know who else I may have missed in your office, thank Ashley you for, Craig. I mentioned thank Ashley and Craig. Craig. I, I don't want to seem thing. too biased. Everyone, everyone. Every, your whole office, which is just great. Um, and by the way, very small office. I didn't mention this, Jackie. 
we have, I don't even know if there are city departments as small as the treasurer's office. <laughs> make it work. <laughs> you, you all do make it work. And, and you mentioned it earlier, Treasurer, you said that um, it is a team effort. And I know just because I get the privilege of working very closely with your office, that you all truly do work as a team. Um, and the city, I'm sure, appreciates that. Um, there are a ton of other things that we could certainly talk about. I'm sure that the other remaining questions will um, either get surfaced to you, will get them cycled to your office, um, to Monique some kind of way, or um, people may reach out to you directly. Um, just for before we close up, I'd like to once again, we mention our sponsors, which are um, BMO Harris Bank, Chicago Federation of Labor, ComEd, Deloitte and Touche, um, Metropolitan Peer and Exposition Authority, Northern Trust, People's Gas and Roosevelt University. Um, we appreciate all of our sponsors and we appreciate you who are on the audience taking time to uh, listen to what the treasurer had to say. Um, I think that the Board of Governors of, Sh of City Club is extremely proud to have you and just know that usually what we do with elected officials is that once you're once you once once we've got you, we've got you. So that means you know you should look to be planned to come back again. Um, there are a couple of things from a housekeeping perspective I need to take care of. And you know that if we were at Maggiano's, everyone be, would be enjoying a cup of coffee in their cannoli right now. But um, I need to, your certificate will be in the mail. Um, the City Club staff is not here today, but when they are back in the office, they will make sure that they get it to you. And then I have to, I hope everyone can see this, um, can. our mug. Um, I love these mugs and uh, people ask all the time, do you have to be a speaker to actually have one? Yes, you do. You actually don't get one unless you're a speaker. So we will get this to your office as quickly as possible. And we hope that you're able to enjoy your tea or your water or whatever you want to enjoy in it. Um, let's see, I just have to, I have to say thank mm -hmm. you to the sponsors. All of the sponsors you mentioned, I work with very often. And even in my prior role as state representative, I've worked with um, many of those organizations. I'll also mention Roosevelt University being my alma mater. So thank yes. you all to the sponsors. That's a nod to you for who's sponsoring today, uh, Madam Treasurer. So please note that. Um, thank you, Treasurer. And again, um, for those who might be interested in membership, please visit our website. And um, if you would like to uh, become a member, you can find all the information there. If you don't find what you're looking for, feel free to call um, the uh, office. I, if I seem a little out of sorts, it's because I'm not used to being in this environment, but I think I've covered just about everything. Um, Treasurer, we are two minutes to 12 o'clock, so thank you for being succinct and precise. Um, we appreciate you and everything that your office does. And we look forward to hopefully, as you said in your speech, seeing everyone in public again, where we can actually sit down and break bread and enjoy a meal and converse with one another. Um, I think this is a very effective format, but certainly there's nothing like human contact. And Chicago is often, um, I often say that Chicago is the biggest small city that I've ever been from. And I'm from a pretty small city. So um, it is certainly a blessing to be able to see everyone in person. And we look forward to that again. So thank you, Jackie. You did an awesome job on today. Thank you, thank Treasurer. You to the Board of Governors and everything that City Club does, really. The way you all have pivoted virtually. Some people could have just said, see you next year when we're able to come in person. So I truly thank you all for providing this platform. It's extremely informational and you all do this all the time. Thank you. We appreciate that. That means a lot, Treasurer. We're working really hard to make sure that we continue to bring informative programming to the city of Chicago. City Club has been around for 115 years, and we certainly cannot let that fail. So we are doing everything within our power to continue. Um, we have sought membership from our member um, support from our membership and financial from financial perspective, and we're also looking at other means. So it's very important. And thank you for saying that. So God bless you, and um, to everyone else, have a wonderful afternoon, and we will see you next time. Thank you, everyone.